All right, so I am going to get started. Um, today's webinar said is about content protection. And as I was putting this together, it became really specifically about content protection as it relates to the CATV industry. I mean, that's kind of obvious because that's where my area of expertise is. Um, and it's definitely where Z-Brand's area of expertise is. Um, I, but I did take the time. There's a slide or two in here for other content protection methodologies, and then I'll talk about where they're utilized and some of that kind of stuff as well, just so that I don't completely neglect a large portion of the content protection industry, uh, you know, just because our focus happens to be on cable television. Um, so really, when I try and put these webinars together, uh, and for those of you, some of you that, have, that are on today, I, I know have been here for basically the entire year, as this is webinar 11 of 12 for our, our webinar Wednesday series this year. Uh, always try and tell a story as I'm putting these together. And the, and the story that I kind of came up with on this one started with why. We have content protection now. We have encryption and digital rights management and all these things. And why? Why do, why do we need this? What's different about television now in 2023 than was different about television in 1993 or 2003 or even 2013 when this wasn't anywhere near as big of a deal as what it is? and like all things that, or most things that we deal with in the world, it could come back to money, right? The answer became finances. Um, and so I was looking into it, and what has happened is the rise of these streaming technologies has led to a decrease in cable TV subscribers. And this is always one of the, the funniest parts to, about a, a webinar when I'm having these discussions with people is, I'm one, right? I am a cord cutter. Everything is streaming here at the house. If we want anything local, we'll throw uh, an OTA antenna on the roof and I can take care of that without bringing anybody else in to, to assist. Um, so, you know, working in the industry of cable television delivery, I don't have an active cable television service at my house. Um, and I'm far from alone in that. I mean, as you can see on the slide, we've dropped from roughly 97 million TV subscribers, which is an impressive number. You consider there's only 330 million people in the United States. To have 97 million TV subscribers or entities with TV subscriptions at the end of 2016, that's a really high adoption rate. Right? You're talking about almost everybody in terms of households at that point in time had cable television um, or, or you know, some, some semblance of it. That number drops from 97 million in... 2016 to 76 million at the end of 2022 and is continuing to drop. So this is a loss of revenue. And when we drop all of this revenue, the most important valuable thing that your service providers have and not uh, or, or not your service providers, your content creators have at that point in time. And this isn't Spectrum and Comcast and, and those types of folks. This is Universal Studios and Paramount and Warner Media and the folks behind the scenes the most valuable thing that they have then, if they are getting less and less revenue from actual cable subscriptions and from bundling a bunch of channel channels together and selling the rights to those channels, is the intellectual property that people care about, right? Your House of Dragons, um, if let's do something from a, a Peacock standpoint, uh, your, your Pitch Perfect, uh, <laughs> probably not, not the one everyone would come up with, but Universal Studios, Harry Potter, that type of stuff. Uh, that is the value. That's where these folks actually have money now. And so because of that, we need to be able to protect this content because you know, we want people to come to the streaming apps or we want to protect what we are sending out from the service provider side of things. And it, again, it all comes back to financially the valuable thing that our content creators, your Universal Studios, Paramount, Disney are sitting on is now the actual intellectual property itself that has people wanting to, to tune into their channel and, and come to their apps. The distribution model itself isn't necessarily as profitable as, as what it had been and is looking even less so from a, a cable TV, linear TV standpoint as we look into the future. So we've decided that we have to protect this content and we have to protect this content. The service providers have to protect this content if they want to be able to redistribute it. So this is all being driven from the top down. This intellectual property is valuable. We must protect this intellectual property. In the residential market, that's kind of a slam dunk because you're only going to get that content one of two ways. You're going to get that content on a set-top box, which is going to have its you know, conditional access card or its M card in it, 
or you're going to get that on an app and then the app's going to have its own form of DRM and digital rights management. So this isn't necessarily a problem that we deal with at home really at all because the solutions already exist. It's just kind of a part of residential television and video delivery that encryption is handled natively. It's, it's not a problem. In the commercial market, what we had done in the days of analog television and in the early days of digital TV is you had your old school set-top box modulator set up, right? So I had a set-top box. I set it to CNN. That's Channel 3. I had a set-top box. set it to Fox News. That's Channel 4. I had a set-top box. set it to ESPN. That's Channel 5. And that was how we created channel content for businesses and commercial entities for years. I mean, how many Pico Maycom, Drake, Blonder Tongue, uh, mini mod, demods, and, and remodulators have you seen in, in your career in the television industry, right? Um, the issue is, and the issue is specifically as we want to take that concept and relate it to content protection, digital rights management, all that kind of stuff, is essentially what you're doing when you're decoding or decrypting that content with the set-top box in the head end and then remodulating it is you're also removing any of that content protection and any of that encryption because that handshake isn't going to be passed through after the, the remodulation process. So service providers, obviously, this, this was a problem. Um, it was a problem before for other reasons, but it became a problem from a service provider standpoint once this is where you lose control over your content protection. So what this has actually given rise to, and this became, as I was putting this webinar together, really what the story is, it's given rise to all of these different bulk conversion devices and bulk delivery solutions that didn't exist 10 years ago that are now basically, you know, the, the bulk, for lack of a better term, no, the majority of the, um, the modulator market. Um, and so it's been really interesting to kind of see that transition and looking at it and kind of analyzing, putting it all together, that's being driven by DRM. It's being driven by content protection. Now, there are a lot of really nice knock-on side effects that we'll get to, um, but it all kind of came back to, we have to protect the content and how can we do that? Um, so the market solution, the one that is most commonly utilized in the CATV industry, and I will get to other industries in, in just a second, um, is ProIdium. And this was a, it, you know, everybody knows this was developed by LG. All of the websites and all of the actual resource material are, are under a Zenith domain, so I have Zenith on here. Um, but this was developed by Zenith slash LG to solve the issue of end-to-end -end encryption in the hospitality market. I promise you that is the only time I will read word for word off my PowerPoint presentation today. Um, but what this does is it's a chipset. It's an IC, an integrated circuit that you can build into your electronic devices. And then that electronic device is able to decrypt ProIdium content. And you can see here in the, let me turn on my laser pointer, in the slide that we've got our HDTV, this is our set top box. And not all content on this slide, not all content from your service providers is encrypted. Right, Our local path here off the OTA transcoder has no encryption whatsoever. But our path from the cable satellite provider and from our digital head end with VOD, or video on demand, does have this ProIdium encryption. And you can see this content here on the VOD side of things is coming and being pushed all the way from the content creator itself and is either decrypted and then re-encrypted at the service provider head end, or ProIdium fixed keys can be passed all the way through from the CMTS out to the edge. Um, we'll get into the specifics on some of this as, as we're looking at different devices, but it's important to note two things from this slide. Number one, not all content requires um, encryption. And then the content that does require encryption with ProIdium specifically that's going to be a fixed key encryption. So all that you need from a, a client standpoint is a television or set-top box that speaks ProIdium and understands it. It's a little different than some of the other DRMs that we'll cover in just a couple of slides that um, you know don't handle things quite that way. So, 
what this actually looks like in terms of the packet structure of the video side of things is like this. And it's important to note here that, again, Proidium is not an authorization-based solution. It's not sending a feed down the line, and then that feed is gathering information about, let me just go back to the other slide to, to kind of map this out. What's not happening with Proidium is it's not sending this feed all the way through the VOD server, talking to this device, and then validating a MAC address, serial number, anything like that, and saying, okay, you are a device that I know is authorized to be on my network. When this content is being created, it has no idea what the serial number of the television is going to be, what the MAC address of the TV is going to be. There's no device ID or machine identifier that the Proidium system pretty, is looking for as you're out here creating this content. It's basically, you can think of it more as like a unidirectional um, encryption solution where it's not going to reject your Samsung television because you're in an LG environment. That's not how Proidium is set up. Um, but what it does do is it embeds this encryption information in the headers of packets. And I have it up here as a bullet on the slide. This is important to remember that when you're getting content from the service provider in the digital era that we are in now, that content coming from the service provider is MPEG content, probably H.264 at this point in time, whether it is RF video over coax, whether it is an IPTV system, or whether it's a, a Z-band system with RF over category six. No matter what you're using as your distribution mechanism, if it is cable TV, like channelized content or multicast content, it's MPEG underneath. And all we're doing, and I'll cover it a little bit more in some of the bulk conversion devices, is changing the wrapper for that content when we're deciding whether or not it's going to be RF or IP. The actual video data itself stays the same. And that's important to note because then I have my transport stream. I can bury the encryption decryption information in either the transport stream header or in the elementary stream header. and my edge device is going to understand that. And the great part about that is this allows us to use a variety of different devices. I think I've duplicated the slide here, it looks like, um, in order to decrypt content. Um, there's not going to be any like one specific device or, or one specific piece of equipment that we have to use on the decryption side of things. We just need something that's going to be able to speak to the transport stream and the elementary stream so that it can understand how to decrypt the data and get to the actual video content, which is what we want to look at here. Um, so it is important to note that this Proidium information is actually embedded into the, the MPEG content of the stream itself. And that's uh, the other one. And so, before we jump into how exactly service providers are doing this and how they're delivering everything and what complications that that's causing for clients, I did want to take just a quick second and note some of the alternate solutions for encryption that exist on the market. And the big one that I wanted to make sure that I covered by name is Google Widevine. And Widevine I wanted to cover because this is your encryption for things like Netflix, right? They're some of your OTT solutions are using Widevine as their digital rights management. And the big thing that's a differentiation between Google Widevine, Verimatrix, and those types of full like edge-to-edge -edge DRM technologies versus your Proidiums and your AESs is this is a rotating key, right? So when I'm communicating with Netflix, we'll just assume we're the client device with the media output here. You are going to make your request, and then every time you're making a request for, what have I been watching lately? Uh, the morning show. I'm watching the morning show on Apple TV. So you, you make your request to watch the morning show, and you watch it for 10 minutes, kid comes home, they want to watch whatever it else it is that they want to watch, so you stop that, walk away, come back. The next time that you go make that request for the morning show, you're making this request back to Netflix. You're getting a completely different DRM key than you did, even if it was 10 minutes ago. And that is not the case with things like 
Pro Idiom and AES, which are fixed key apparatuses. Now they're like maybe 128 bit or 256 bit fixed keys, but they're still fixed keys. Um, so that's the big difference between the Pro Idiom AES broadcast technologies that a lot of us deal with on a day to day basis and the Netflix, you know, more uh, OTT streaming delivery services that uh, are also very, very much in this industry, but not necessarily relevant to our customer base on a day-to-day -day basis, is whether or not that key is rotating every time you access content or whether or not that key is a fixed key. Um, so I did want to make sure I took a second to cover that because it felt disingenuous to talk about encryption without mentioning the biggest one. Um, but it's also not necessarily directly relevant to, to what it is we all do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so now that we've covered that, actually jumping into how service providers do this. Um, delete my spectrum. I did. Whoops. Now, all right. Well, I'm not sure what happened. It appears as if I accidentally deleted the slide. That's fine. We'll take care of it. Um, so the first one, let's talk about Comcast and how they handle their encryption um everything uh, coming in uh, from an enterprise architecture standpoint when we've dealt with comcast um they bring in everything whether if you're getting their data services their tv services everything comes in on a pipe and then they hit a device and the device splits those things out you know your data services head to the network the TV services head towards either the coaxial distribution infrastructure, if you're going coax to set-top boxes everywhere, or for our environments, for a lot of our clients, it's going to hit some form of bulk conversion device. And I was very not specific about this with Comcast because we've done you know, projects with Comcast this year. And it's not the same device depending on exactly what it is you are trying to do with the Comcast service. Uh, it's been several years since we've had a new Comcast installation go in without them enforcing ProAdium encryption on everything. But this device changes depending on whether I want my multicast IP output or whether I would like an RF um, coaxial output. So even though Comcast is kind of bringing it in and on this QAM input, you have the ability to go either direction. Um, it is a different device and gets specified during the implementation process which direction you want to go. Are we doing coax or, or multicast? What encryption is supported on that multicast? And Comcast specifically um, has a, a pretty regimented approval process for anything that is not in the normal box, right? If you're not saying, hey, we want to do coax this or we want to do IPTV with ProIdium encryption, there's a specific approval process for a specific team that you have to go through in order to get your solution approved. And just as a like an example for, for us, we have uh, we use AES encryption, 128-bit AES encryption on some of our IPTV projects. Not all of them, some of them. Um, and on those projects, we have to get specific encryption or approval from Comcast that our encryption is acceptable for the AES 128-bit side of things. And it is, we've gotten that approved, but that process, if you have maybe a manager or a territory rep who's unfamiliar with that process, or if you provide bad documentation, which we've definitely done, unfortunately, in the past, or had partners do um, because they didn't run it by us first and we're just a little naive as to, to what the full requirements are to, to get the approval from Com Comcast, um, that whole process, we've had it take up to six months. And this is one of the things I hit on later in the presentation, but so many people in the TV, television, video industry were used to, we need a TV service. We're going to call the TV company, the cable TV company. They're going to climb out to the power lines, split off, split off of a tap that's on the power line, run us a feed into the building. And that's TV service. We only need like a, a week's notice. That's just simply not how it works anymore. Um, and one of the things that we found is that there's a ton of 
regional variation in how certain service providers are handling things. And I'll, I did have a slide in there on how Spectrum was was handling everything. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to that slide. I guess I accidentally duplicated a different one. Um, but Spectrum is kind of the same deal as Comcast, where they're going to bring in the, the difference between them and Comcast is rather than bring in everything as IP, split it out between data services and television services, and then convert the television services back to IP if you want to. With Spectrum, you have an option to just have multicast delivered directly to your facility and have the multicast sent out that way. And then they have the opposite approach. Well, they'll convert that back to RF if that's what's necessary. So you get variation from service provider to service provider to service provider as to how they're handling your television delivery, what their processes are for approval of your system if you're not doing kind of standard linear television and what the lead times on those those things are. The really interesting part about that is that variation we've noticed can even be different within the same service provider. And that makes a ton of sense, right? I think you can understand why that would be. Obviously, I have a much more widespread and robust fiber network in, you know, the Boston to Washington megalopolis that exists versus if I do, if I'm in the middle of the Southwest or, you know, certain parts of the Northwest and middle, you know, middle of the country where there's just not infrastructure to be able to support getting a fiber drop, fiber drop to your hospital. Um, you know, it's, it's just not there yet. So you will see a bunch of regional variation. And the other thing that we get all the time, which I wanted to make sure I pointed out on this slide, is you can't just dial the 1-800 number on the back of your Comcast set-top box or your Spectrum set-top box and expect to get a team that understands the questions that you're asking when you're asking them these questions. Um, most, and I can speak for at least the top five or six cable providers in the U.S. in terms of how we've dealt with them over the last year in projects, most of the major CATV providers have dedicated enterprise sales teams, not just for television, but the enterprise sales team covers television, data, data storage, internet delivery. They are who you need to speak to when you are looking for bulk television solutions. And one of the most common complaints that we get from clients is that they can't find this person. They know they have a Comcast account, but they pick up the phone, they dial the Comcast number, they give Comcast their account number, and they are met with a more standard, and it's not just Comcast, I apologize, I'm not intending to pick on Comcast whatsoever, um, but you know, generic service provider. And then they get, give them the account number and they're met with someone who's got 99% of their time is spent talking about residential clients and residential delivery systems and residential technologies. So the, um, the process with certain service providers can be a little painful. And, and one of the most painful parts actually is just navigating to the appropriate person. So if you have a client, you're in the middle of a TV system design or at the beginning of a TV system design, I know it sounds silly, uh, but if you're going the cable TV route, find an account manager early because we, we have issues all the time on an annual basis. We are doing multiple projects where the client waited too long to reach out for television services and television delivery. And they are opening buildings without TV because they just, the time horizon takes longer than you would think. Um, and so that is going to wrap up TV providers in terms of our, our linear, linear cable TV providers. And we're going to transition a little bit into satellite and the satellite guys. This is interesting because I like their business model is different, right? Most of the time you're dealing with a television service provider, uh, a cable TV provider. Um, they have their home office and then the technicians that they're sending out to your house are contractors, right? And they're working through whatever contract that they have with the service provider. Our satellite providers tend to work differently, where they are actually authorized commercial resellers of this equipment, and they are buying it from authorized commercial distributors of this equipment. Like DirecTV in the U.S. only has 
I think it's three. It might be four now. But there's only a handful of actual direct TV distributors in the United States that are authorized to sell and configure this equipment. And what they have done from their standpoint is they have a, a blade and chassis system. So direct TV, the feed comes in and you decrypt whatever content and programming you want to decrypt. Most of the time, the way this works is they want you to send them all this information in advance. So you have a pre-configured, ready to rock and roll channel lineup that, that comes in. And then all that needs to be done by the commercial reseller is they go up, they mount the antenna on the roof, they make sure that all that's done to code, they lock in the signal, they bring your fiber down or your coax down into the, the DMARC or the head end, and it comes into this COM3000 device. And you'll notice right here, you can see it, COM3000 is produced and manufactured by Technicolor. It is not a device that DirecTV makes for themselves, but it is a device that's specific to Direct TV, and this is one of the things that I wanted to hit on, um, and I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit later. But we have this issue now within the industry where so many times I'll see a spec, um, and, and someone copy and pasted from like an old analog spec, let's say, and the anticipation is you know we'll deliver eighty-five channels of unencrypted content you know, to be compatible with other TV systems as desired in the future. Well, like that's a nonsense spec, right? Like, and I don't want to put too fine of a point on it, but like that's just not possible in the world that we live in anymore because this box that we have here from DirecTV is not compatible with this box that we get from Dish. Even though they're functionally doing the same thing, right? I'm down converting my high frequency satellite content into modulated RF channels or to outbound multicast IP channels and embedding encryption in those content streams, these are not interoperable devices. And the same principle applies when we're talking about service providers as well. If we go back to the Comcast slide, that coax feed comes in to whatever the device happens to be. Let's say it's an ATX Ucrypt into the ATX Ucrypt. Well, the Ucrypt has slots in the rear panel for M cards, authorization cards, digital access cards, um, which tell the service provider what content you're authorized for and what content you aren't authorized for. I mean, that's what's going on within the set-top box at your house as well. If you ever took the time to take your cable set-top box apart, there's an M card in there that's actually doing all of your authorization and validation back to uh, you know, the CMTS of the service provider. So if you switch from Comcast to Altice, Optimum, let's pick a different one. Um, those M cards that you got from Comcast are useless. And you can still use the Ucrypt, sure, but you need to go back and get completely different M cards and go through whatever approval process that Altice slash Optimum has in order to get their services put into place and take and that you know you have more months of work to get all of that done. So when we see specs these days and the specification says you know TV systems should be interoperable across multiple providers or all 150 channels should be provided in the clear that's just not something that we see as guaranteeable anymore. Um, it's much safer to make sure that your clients are actually putting in ProIdium TVs. And this is really where I wanted to get to with the webinar and kind of where the, the story all starts to tie together, is there are a lot of pain points with digital content protection, with encryption, all that other kind of fun stuff. Um, and, and one of the things that we've seen is the TVs themselves, right? So we talked about it at the beginning. The TVs are more expensive because you have to get your license through LG. It has to have a specific integrated circuit or chipset to be within that. And your commercial off-the-shelf devices don't have that. This little screen blob over here, I pulled this off the Best Buy website the other day when I was doing, um, when I was putting this presentation together. Because if you were actually diving through the specs, this was like a Samsung 
Q80C or something like that. I mean, they're nice. It's a $1,500, 65-inch OLED TV. It's a nice television, right? It's not something that we just, like, picked the cheapest thing that we could at, um, you know, at, at Walmart and decided, oh, this is a terrible television. No, I pulled this off of a a nice TV. This television, you can go spend, you know, 1200 bucks at, at Best Buy for a 65-inch OLED it won't decrypt pro idiom. And we get this on a regular basis from clients more so in the corporate slash commercial space than in the healthcare space, because healthcare is well aware of this by this point in time. Um, where they went out and a person or an executive bought a TV for their office, they come in, plug in the television, focus. Absolutely nothing is happening. And it's because these commercial off-the-shelf devices are not designed to work with ProIDM content. And they tell you that, as you can see, if you know what to look for. Um, and one of the other things that we've seen here that's kind of driving some of this from a TV tuning standpoint are, I put this little note in here that digital and ProIDM are not interchangeable terms because we have, specifically in the healthcare space, some of the stuff that you need to look out for a little bit is you have televisions in places where we don't traditionally put TVs. And one of the places where it pops up most of all is like your dialysis clinics, right? Where you have these more swing arm based tele uh, televisions or Android, Android tablets that are functioning as televisions. And you get inconsistent results there um, across the different manufacturers and more importantly, the manufacturers themselves the different generations of technology um, within those manufacturers. So there are plenty of manufacturers out there for swing arm TVs that will tell you, yes, they have a digital tuner. Yes, they have a digital tuner does not mean, yes, we have a digital tuner and it will decrypt ProIdium. And, and within certain markets and, and really just certain subsections within those markets, that's an important question to ask, an important um, detail within that is yes, you have a digital tuner. Does that digital tuner decrypt ProIdium? Because that's gonna be the difference a lot of the time uh, in your television working and not working, or maybe even the decision that you make in swing arm manufacturers. Uh, the other thing that we see a lot here um, is because we, we covered it specifically with Spectrum, but some of the other service providers are looking to bring in 60, 80, 100, 120 channels of TV content, that's more or less a gig of data. Um, it, it, it's a little bit less than that, but roughly a gig of data that they're trying to bring in on these links. A lot of C CATV providers these days are trying to bring in fiber. And we've had several projects in New York and other places where they can't get fiber into the building. Uh, or it's going to take them six months to get fiber into the building because of all of the paperwork and everything that you have to go through to get fiber into buildings. Um, so we have seen clients just cancel TV services entirely uh, because they can't get past the right-of-way issue, issues and access issues in order to get the fiber into the building to bring in TV services. So there are definitely, as we've become more stringent with we must encrypt this content, oh, I forgot one, Analog to digital conversion. I realize, yes, that the analog sunset was 10 years ago. I, I get it. I, so if you're rolling your eyes at me right now, apologies in advance. We still deal with clients every quarter that are either at the front end of or in the middle of an analog to digital conversion. And one of the biggest pain points in the analog to digital conversion is that full refresh of every television throughout. The facility to and again it led into that digital and proidium are not interchangeable not only do these clients need to go out and get new televisions but a lot of the times they can't go out and get the 500 dollars television they have to go get the thousand twelve hundred fifteen hundred eighteen hundred dollar television because they need that proidium decryption so there is quite a bit of pain here that you can see that's inflicted on the client for content protection. Now, the big benefit, the massive upside that you get 
is you are getting a more secure, better signal in a smaller footprint with far less equipment expense than you used to get. And I'm going to scroll back a couple of slides just to kind of hammer that point home. Um, the COM 3000, and, and I'm, I want to touch on one other thing with the COM 3000. The COM 3000 is less than 5RU. I think it's 4RU, maybe 3RU off the top of my head. Each one of these little COM 51 blades supports enough channels for you to basically you know, keep your entire hospital entertained without the need for anything else to be in the chassis. You can run a sports bar or a hospital or a hotel off of three RU and two or three blades. That's your TV system. 10 years ago, 15, man, I'm getting old. 15 years ago, when I started in this industry, um, that was not the case, right? You needed a set-top box per channel, and you were remodulating all that, and you were spending tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars in racks and racks and racks and racks and racks of space. We have a client in Manhattan that their head end for their broadcast studio in 2018 was 10 racks? Yeah, 10 full-size racks of, of television equipment. And they are far from alone. We had a healthcare chain in the Midwest uh, uh, that was five or six racks of equipment. So you are saving so much space. <laughs> um, and with the space freeing up rack space, freeing up infrastructure, all of the stuff that comes along with that in cost savings, for the same delivery and the same quality of service. You are now getting, or well, better quality of service. You are getting better quality content that most of the time your service providers or their authorized resellers can access remotely to troubleshoot um, in a smaller footprint. So I, I am not normally one to advocate for uh, you know, your, your service providers and what it is that they're doing. Because like I pointed out at the beginning, it's, it's a money game. And at some point in time, that becomes frustrating for everybody. But you know, as I was digging into this and as I was starting to talking about encryption and content protection, it's really kind of become, it's, you're getting some upside for this, right? It's not like, oh, we're just getting the, all of the things that we have to do uh, as clients to make sure that we are pro idiom ready and we get nothing for it. There is actually a pretty nice um, upside to all of this content protection and bulk conversion world that we're in now. And it's been really fascinating over the last five, six years to see this having gone from something that was like in its infancy. And I can remember being at like Infocom and NAB when the first smart boxes and COM 3000s and stuff were coming out to now where I, this is just what it is. I mean, we haven't done a commercial install over the last year or two where they're not using something like this. I mean, this is... Uh, Maybe we have a handful of clients who will do eight or 10 set top boxes and, and modulate that way. But for the most part, all we're seeing these days are the bulk conversion devices with ProIdium, or if you want to go down the path of not ProIdium, with some pretty serious paperwork to make sure that the service provider knows that they can tell the content creators that their content is protected. And that, again, is really what's driving all of this is just this content protection um, so that the intellectual property of the, the broadcasters and the content creators is, is protected. Um, so it has put a little bit of work on everybody and, and made things a little more difficult, but also there's some upside, right? A smaller footprint and, and less cost. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what's going on with um, content protection service providers. And again, the, the thing that's a headache and the thing that I wanted to make sure that I pointed out is there is still no standard from the service providers as to how you go down this path of, of getting content and making sure that that content is, is protected. It's gonna vary service provider by service provider by service provider, and potentially even regionally within those service providers, depending on what infrastructure may exist within those regions. So the advice that I'll leave the webinar with is talk to your service provider early, um, earlier than you think you should, because if you leave it to the last Two months before the 
the system is supposed to go live to finally engage with the service provider and have them bring in a circuit, you are probably leaving it too late. Um, and that wasn't always the case. And it may not be the case in all of your projects, depending on you know which service provider you pick. But it is good advice to tell you to engage early with the with the service provider. So with that, I will um, I'll be quiet. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can put it in the chat or the Q&A. And I'll be here for another couple of minutes. And then I'll uh, let you guys go and get back to your day. All right, I see one question. And yes, I will. I'm not sure what I did, in all honesty. I, I was working on two different presentations because I have a Bixie ICT tomorrow that I'm presenting at. I don't know. I'll have to check that one. I hope I didn't copy and paste it into the wrong presentation. But yes, I will clean this slide up, put the appropriate spectrum slide in, and then get this out to you guys. Um, so yeah. Ooh, that's a good question. So um, we have seen, so the, the question, I don't know if you guys can see it, is have you seen hospitals get waivers to avoid encryption? And the short answer is, Yes, we have seen some healthcare facilities get waivers to avoid encryption. Um, we've seen commercial and government entities get those same waivers as well. The, the places that I have seen struggle to get waivers the most um, would be your sports bars, hotels, those types of things where the TV is more for entertainment purposes than it is, um, you know, something that happens to be there as an ancillary part of the experience right like healthcare nobody's going to a healthcare facility to watch tv versus a sports bar that's obviously like a big part of it um but i will say john the exception that i have there is i haven't seen it from comcast in a couple of years um uh, the other service providers i can probably recount specific examples of the encryption getting waived i haven't seen it from comcast in a few years Right. Don't see any other questions coming in. So I'm going to call it for today. I do hope that you join us next month for the final webinar Wednesday of the year. And then just as an announcement, we're not going to kill the webinar Wednesdays as we go into 2024, but uh, we're going to switch to a pre-recorded YouTube presentation that will then be available for everyone video on demand versus at this scheduled time. So that's kind of hilarious now at the end of this webinar because Z band is cord cutting <laughs> the webinar Wednesday series to make it OTT for everybody. Um, so yeah, still going to keep doing this content. I think we're doing a lot of valuable stuff, but we're going to switch it up a little bit going on the next year to make it more adaptable to everybody's schedules. And then you can, we can just do Q and a and YouTube comments and emails and that kind of stuff. So thanks everybody very much for coming out. I appreciate all of the attendance and the questions throughout the year. And yeah, look forward to talking to you soon. Take care.